Welcome to Tuesday evening Bible study. For 30 minutes, we're going to be teaching on peace. And so I'd like to just pray to begin with and give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to work here. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to shine. Let Jesus shine through this study. Quicken it to every heart that those who are watching might know that they will have peace in their hearts. Peace. It's available to every believer in Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, wonderful Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, you no doubt heard a lot of greetings say shalom, right? Uh, Hebrew word for peace. In the Arabic world, it's salam. Salam alaikum. Peace be with you. Both those words mean peace. But what they really mean is, you need not fear me. I mean you no harm. I haven't got anything evil in my heart toward you. That's what it means. And of course, you can't say shalom or salam if you're bearing a weapon in your hand. <laughs> because that contradicts what you're saying. You have to leave your weapon home or throw it down and walk away from it. That corroborates the meaning of shalom or salam. Hallelujah. And you know, back in the Old Testament, I want to just remind you a little bit of the story of Abraham when he, he went to uh, defeat the kings, the five kings from Mesopotamia. And uh, when he defeated them with his household servants and the servants of uh, his neighbors, then coming back to the to, uh, place where he was, Hebron, he met Melchizedek. Melchizedek. And I want to uh, read you that a moment. Over in Genesis chapter 14, just for a moment. <clears throat> And Melchizedek, verse 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, or Shalom, or Shalem, which means peace, brought forth bread and, and wine and to the Most High God. And he blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, who has delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And Abraham gave him tithes of all. Abraham recognized his greatness. Tremendous great. In fact, if you turn over to Hebrews, book of Hebrews, chapter 7, and we're going to look at verse 2 here. Now we'll start off with verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, also met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, which we just read. Verse 2, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, <clears throat> all, of all, first being, by interpretation, king of righteousness, that's his name, Melchi, king, Zedek, Righteousness, or Zadok, Melchizedek, King of Righteousness, which is by interpretation King of Righteousness, and after that also King of Peace, which would be Melchi Shalom, the King of Peace. Now, I submit to you, there is no other person in the Bible, anyone, who is called King of Righteousness and King of Peace other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if we may be so bold to say, this is pretty good proof that Melchizedek is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And he met Abraham coming back from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And so he was called the king of righteousness and the king of peace. God's peace. That's right. 
only peace means no war. No war. Nobody dying, nobody being subjected to being shot at, nobody subjected to explosions, to losing their lives. That's peace in the eyes of the world, but not in the eyes of God. God's peace goes further, and God's peace is not the world's peace at all. Let's go on. So Jerusalem is called the city of peace. Urushalem. Urushalem. When you say it fast, it sounds like Jerusalem, except for the J. Urushalem. City of peace. Now, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. If you look over in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, we're going to chase through the scriptures uh, talking about how peace occurs and the meaning of it in each case. So Isaiah 9, verse 6, is the famous prophecy that Jesus would be born and he would be Emmanuel, God with us. Here it is. Excuse me, that's not right. Isaiah 9, 6. He's not called Emmanuel there. He's called Emmanuel in Isaiah 7, 14. All right, 9, 6. For unto us a, a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. That's right. No one else is called that in the scripture. You can, a prince and a king are roughly the same thing. That's right. And so here he is, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. That's his name. Now, more than that, that's one of God's attributes. Peace. Remember, in Galatians 22, it says, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, good faith, meekness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So that's one of the fruits of the Spirit because it's one of the characteristics of God. One of the characteristics of the Father. That's right. That's Father God. That's our Daddy. He is peace. He's never disturbed. If we are, some are really disturbed. Things happen which we don't expect. Uh, for instance, uh, let me just quote uh, two days ago, Kobe Bryant was killed in a helicopter crash. Totally unexpected. And yeah, we, we mourn the man. But, you know, these things happen from time to time. And so it's unexpected, but not not to God. He's never frustrated uh, at a loss as to what to do next because God has it all planned. God knows the future, he knows the past, and he knows the present. But you see, we have a voice in all that. God doesn't overrule us. God works with us. In fact, I'm going to use this instruction which I have taught all my classes, I say God never works alone, and you never work alone. God works with you. That's two, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 9a. It says, for we are co-laborers together with God. Co-laborers, that's right. We, su we supply the coal. God supplies the labor. <laughs> Sometimes we work hard too. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. Now, I'd like you to remember these four major scriptures. In fact, I'm going to recommend that you memorize these four scriptures. Now, you don't have to do it all at once. Just take your time. Four scriptures concerning peace are the heart and soul of who Jesus is. Now on scripture, Isaiah 32, 17. 
Isaiah 32, verse 17. It's in the same book where we, we just were. And this is what the, the scripture says there. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. <coughs> oh, so peace is the product of righteousness. Now that gives us a clue all of a sudden. Some people have it very hard to, to have peace in their hearts and in their lives. Very hard for them. Everything worries them. Everything concerns them. Where is the righteousness involved? Ah, we haven't looked for that, have we? But the work of righteousness should be peace. If there's absolutely no peace, maybe there's no righteousness. I'm sorry. That's what the Bible says. So we've got to look at our lives. If we don't have peace in our lives, peace in our hearts, maybe we are not manifesting righteousness. We aren't producing peace. Now you say, oh, but Jack, the sacrifice of, of Jesus on the cross gave us eternal life. Yes, that's true. And it gave us peace. Yes, that's true. But you have to appropriate that to yourself. It's not automatic. Positionally, you have it. But practically, in a practical way, sometimes you don't have peace. I'm saying positionally, yes, you're saved by the blood of Jesus because you received and so you are entitled to peace. It's part of the kingdom of God. But if you don't take it and appropriate it and do it, rest in the Lord, according to what Hebrews 4 says. You have to enter into his rest. That's right. And if you don't do that, you aren't going to have peace. Because you always have strife. You're striving to reach striving to get that peace, striving, no, <laughs> you rest in what has already been provided you. God's peace has already been provided, but you have to reckon it so to yourself. You reckon things. You reckon that you are righteous. You don't have to earn that. You don't have to work to achieve it. You just reckon it to be so. And the same thing for peace. Righteousness, if you are righteous, it produces peace. Now, maybe you aren't acting in a righteous manner. You're acting in a manner of the world. The world doesn't know what righteousness is. Maybe you're acting according to the way they act, they react. You aren't going to have peace. You need to have God's peace. Okay, that was Isaiah 32, verse 17. The next one, Isaiah 26, verse 3. Isaiah 26, verse 3. These are very good scriptures to memorize. 26, verse 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Read it in King James. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. His mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. Wow. So that's what brings peace, is the trust in God. Trust. Like you're throwing your whole life over onto him. You're leaning totally upon him. That is a wise person who does that because, as you know, we alone, by ourselves, cannot affect what we want. We cannot, we can strive for it, but we cannot achieve it. But if you go with what God says, and if you stay your mind on him, you'll never be confounded or confused. I'm not saying that you're always going to get the thing that you want. No. 
but you're going to get the thing that God wants you to have. And that's superior to what you want. Amen. You want what God wants you to have. Amen? Because yes. then you're pleasing God. Then you're, a, then you're useful to him. If you're only going for the things that please you, that's, I'm sorry, that's flesh and that's soul. That's right. That's not God's will. God's will is that you fulfill everything he has for you to do on this earth. That's why you're here. I hope you all know why you're here. I hope you all are confident what God has called you to do on this earth, what, who he has called you to influence, what he has called you to do, whether it's writing a book or, or uh, preaching the gospel or doing anything, uh, being a lawyer, being a uh, medical doctor, whatever it is, being a teacher. In every profession, the Lord wants you to manifest the life of Jesus because you are special. You know, I'm, I'm going to say this once again. I, I preached it a lot. We are a new creation. Brand new. That's right. There never was a Jack Tulse like you're seeing now. Before I, I got saved in 1978, you wouldn't want to know me. That's right. I wasn't following the Lord. Oh, I knew about him mentally, but I hadn't committed my life to him. I didn't say, Lord, get in the front seat and drive my car of my life. No, I was driving it. I crashed it. <laughs> That's why I, I changed. I got in the back seat. I said, Lord, car of my life. And so we are a new creation. And because we are, we operate under new laws, new spiritual laws. That's right. If you go into a, say that you go from the earth to a planet far off in the edge of the universe, one that you can't even see from the earth. You land on that planet, oh, you find it's inhabited. And the people there have laws to live by. You have to conform to those laws. Well, we are new. We have entered into the kingdom of God. Amen. That's a new position. Yes. A whole yes. new, if you want to, I can say planet. All right. It's a new position in God. And so we are brand new. It's a spiritual kingdom. And it will be a physical kingdom when Jesus returns. Right now, it's spiritual. And we're in it, and it's just as real spiritually as it is, as it will be physically when Jesus returns. And so the kingdom of God must manifest through us, because we are the sons and daughters of the kingdom. So peace is one of the, one of the things, one of the manifestations of the kingdom of God. It's a manifestation of the Spirit of God. Let's go on. The third scripture, Romans 14, 17. Romans 14, verse 17. I know a lot of you know that by heart. I want to read it. For the kingdom of God is not food, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is another way that you can tell if you're in the kingdom of God. Not only is there peace in your heart, but and righteousness, of course, produces that peace. But you have joy also. You have something to be happy about, something to rejoice in, something to look forward to. You don't look backward on your old life. In fact, even yesterday, things that happened yesterday, whether they're good things or bad things, they're yesterdays. You can't change them. But you can change today's and tomorrow's. And so, the things, even good things that happened yesterday, right? You say, oh, yeah, it's God's trophy. What happened? But it's hanging on my wall. <laughs> Amen? You can rejoice in that. And because 
You have a destiny to fulfill, which is not fulfilled yet, or you'd be, be home with Jesus. It's not done yet. You can look forward to fulfilling it, and that brings joy. It brings great joy. Hallelujah. I love to think about the fruitfulness that God is going to bring about in the future trips that we take to the nations. Okay, the last scripture, Colossians 3.15. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. That scripture here, it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Folks, it's the peace of God that's the arbitrator of what you do, of the action you take. God's peace. It's not like the world's peace. God's peace calms your heart totally, calms it down. Now, let me give you an example. Supposing that you have, uh, you are in between jobs, and you interview a few places, and you get two job offers, and they're both good job offers. They're a higher pay than you're earning now. And so, and they're, they're widely diverse, the ones in the East Coast and the ones up in Seattle, Washington. And so they're far apart, a whole nation apart. Now, you go through prayer, say, Lord, what do I do? Both jobs are good job, good pay. I like to do them, both of them. I don't know what you want me to do. Folks, Make it a spiritual choice. Ask God. This is what you should ask him. Father, in my future walk with you, which place would you prefer that I go to grow faster and to grow more and to have more fruit for the kingdom of God? What do you say? And then listen. Be quiet for a while. Let your heart be still. And your mind rest and let God make it. And when you do, when he, he does, he may ask you a question and let you make the decision, of course, which he always does. But I mean, he'll ask you a question. Where would you like to influence more people on the West Coast or East Coast? Where would you like to be in the coming move of the Holy Spirit? Then you ask God, Lord, where, where is that going to be? <laughs> I want to be where that is. <laughs> right? And so he'll give you an inkling of, see, son, I'm going to move in power where there currently is not much power. Then you know the East Coast. That's it. There's not much power there. Very liberal. If you move there, God's going to move in a mighty way and bring a tremendous re revival. That's your decision. You move where you can accomplish what God wants you to do in this life. Hallelujah. All right. Now, Jesus made us righteous through the cross and resurrection. Positionally, we are We are just, we are righteous. In fact, over in Romans 5, verse 1, it declares that very clearly. Romans 5, verse 1. Another good scripture to memorize. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are justified by faith. That's right. Your faith, Jesus' faith. That's right. You're justified. And therefore, we have peace with God. We don't have to strive. We don't have to achieve. We can rest. That doesn't mean we're lazy. No, not at all. 
It means that we don't have to do the work that Jesus already did for us. We can't repeat it. We aren't qualified to do that. He earned it for us. Don't try and earn it for yourself. Rejoice at it and appropriate it. Take it into your life. Rest in peace. That's right. Hallelujah. Over in John 14, verse 27, there's a good verse there, a good scripture. Jesus was going to go back to heaven after the cross. And in John 14, verse 27, he gives kind of a farewell to his disciples. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as give I unto you let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid I love that God's peace and you know folks Grace and I experienced that one time back in 1970 we took a car trip to Alaska we, we took the Alcan Highway all the way to Alaska and then in Alaska most of the highways were paved well, we took the highway to Mount McKinley, to Denali, and for miles and hours, we saw no living thing, nothing. We were way out in the wilderness, and you know, Alaska is the largest state, just a great empty space. And then we saw an animal, a black wolf moving toward the road. <laughs> we said, boy, this is way out in the boondocks, and just to... Comfort our hearts, we turned the radio on, and the first thing we heard was John 14, 27. Let not your heart be troubled. <laughs> My peace I give you, not as the world gives to you. That was radio station Glen Allen, Alaska, and it really calmed us down. We said, hey, God knows where we are. Even in the middle of nowhere, he knows us. He sees us. Three Hallelujah. Yeah. Three kids. Too. We had three kids in our car. Yeah. Yeah. Ten years old and seven and four. And so we, and we camped out every night. We had a good time. So, Jesus is also the peace between Jews and Gentiles. Over in Ephesians chapter 2, 14. Ephesians 2, 14. This is what the Word says about that. It's speaking about Jews and Gentiles. For he that is Christ is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. The wall of partition between Jew and Gentile, between circumcision and uncircumcision. He broke that totally. That's right. Because it says, in, I believe it's in uh, Galatians 5, verse 6, For in Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith works by love. That's right. So Christ broke down that middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. And both of us come to Jesus in faith the same way. Not by circumcision. We come by faith. Hallelujah. God's peace is not the world's peace. In fact, I've mentioned that. But I want you to know you cannot understand God's peace. You can understand the world's peace. They make treaties, they sign agreements. In fact, when the Japanese surrendered to the United States in World War II on the battleship of Missouri, uh, they signed a piece of paper. And after that, the war was officially over. No more dying. No more. That's the world's peace. Right? But God's peace isn't that way. God's peace, you can't understand it. But you just experience it. Over in Philippians 4, verse it says that. 
Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. This is what the Word says. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So it not only calms your heart, but it keeps your mind also. It keeps your mind at peace and rest, resting. Even though you may not understand it. You may not understand why or how that happens, but you just know. This is a characteristic of the kingdom of God. We don't have to understand everything. We don't have to be clever and be able to explain it all. That's right. But we can receive it without understanding. Hallelujah. So glad for that. We can rely on God's peace and safety when we sleep. Over in Psalm 4, verse 8. Uh, let me quote it to you. It says, I will both lie down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. I will both lay down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Now, folks, you may have a bad dream. You may wake up with a nightmare. Immediately when that happens, Calm your heart with God's peace. In the first place, you will be peaceful as you sleep. Absolutely. God brings that peace. And secondly, you have authority over the enemy who wants to disturb you, break up your sweet peace, break up your sleep. You have that authority. Command him to leave you alone. Speak to him. Say, enemy, get out of my mind. Get out of my brain. I command you. You have no choice. You must obey me. I have authority over you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Go. Get out of this room. Get out of this house. And never come back. I will lie down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, Psalm 34, verse 14, the Word tells us, the Bible tells us to seek peace. Psalm 34, 14. That's right. <clears throat> it's not always automatic. Sometimes you have to seek it. Especially if you're in a condition where there is a lot of chaos. There's chaos all around you. There's uh, jabbering or talking or things are, are exploding all around you, say, like on a battlefield. Hand grenades exploding, slugs flying overhead, explosions from shells, shell fire, right? It says, seek peace and pursue it. How do you do that? You seek the one who brings peace. Jesus, I'm seeking you right now. You're the bringer of my peace. You are my peace. You are my peace. Immediately, your spirit is calm. Your mind is calm. Your thoughts are clear. You know exactly what to do. Exactly. Maybe hunker down in the foxhole, or maybe it'll give you a strategy how to win against the enemy. And you might be able to capture a whole squad of the enemy through his strategy. That's right. We can listen to God. God always provides a plan and strategy. Just like he did to David. He provided a strategy whereby David defeated the Philistines. And it was so mighty a victory that David said, The Lord broke forth upon my opponent like a breaking forth of waters. You know, that means like a tidal wave. <laughs> yeah, so David called that place Perez, breach or breakthrough, breakthrough. Amen. One more, Ephesians 4, verse 3. You see, God addressed the peace in various situations. Ephesians 4, verse 3 is basically talking about relationships between Christians, between believers. 
I have heard too many times from Christian pastors, they deprecate other denominations. They look down their nose at them, which is, to me, that's a sin. You never do that to your brothers in Christ and sisters. You never do that. Even though they don't agree with you, absolutely, they're your brothers and sisters in Christ. And you want to have peace with them, so you have to appreciate them, not depreciate them. You appreciate them. It says over in Ephesians 4, verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, we have the bond of peace, or should have, between denominations. And so we have to keep that unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know, folks, I have a, a testimony here. When years ago, about 20 years ago, when we were first going to Myanmar or, or Burma, uh, I went up in the jungle with uh, my class, not the whole class, four students. I was training them. And we had split up into four teams of four persons each. And I went with one of the teams just to see how they would, would uh, function. Did they, could, did they accept my teaching? And would they put it into practice as they went from village to village? Well, we were up in the mountains in this one village. And wow, I couldn't believe it. It was a Catholic village. Hallelujah. And so we had a good time there. They were brothers in the faith. We can work together in some things. There was a man there who was dying of cholera. Well, we not only prayed for him, we gave him an injection of saline solution. He recovered quickly. That's right. We can work with Catholics if they will permit us. We can work with anyone, any brother and sister in Christ, if they will permit. If we can agree together on one thing, you know, can we agree that this man will be prayed for and he'll, he'll be healed? Yes, we believe that too. Good, let's pray together. Boom, you may pray stronger than they. You may command in the name of Jesus and they close their eyes and fold their hands and pray. It's okay, it's fine. We don't worship the same way. We don't pray the same way. We don't sing the same way, the same song. But we can pray together and it's it's unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Hallelujah. I'm going to quit here. It's important, I think, for us to choose righteousness in what we do. And I'm thinking specifically about the election of president coming up in about 285 days. We have to choose a man to lead our nation. And so I'm saying, I'm not going to say one thing or the other, which name I'm going to be for. I say to you, choose righteousness. Because if you do, the peace of God will be on your heart. And you will choose God's man for this time. Choose righteousness. Not a liar, not a party that's for murdering infants in the womb and outside the womb. Not a party that believes in same-sex marriage. No. Righteousness. That's what we choose. That's what the Bible enjoins us to do. Choose righteousness. Because if you do, it produces peace. Be full of peace this week. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up my hand to all those who hear. I bless them in the name of Jesus. I bless them with the blessings of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And Lord, the blessings of Jesus under the new covenant. Because those who listen and obey the word of God are in the new covenant. And Lord, they are the blessed. I thank you for peace in their hearts. And their lives will reflect it. And the righteousness will bear much fruit. Not only peace, but other fruit for the kingdom of God. It will bear souls. 
it'll bear good thing, good fruit for your kingdom, Lord. And I bless them now as they take this to heart. Thank you, Father. You're God of peace. Melki Shalom. And I say that to you all. Shalom and good night.